Okay, and with that, I will invite our next speaker, so uh, Dr. Tara Sainath from Google Incorporated. Thank you so much for coming. Okay, so thank you to the organizers for having me here. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is how neural networks um, started in speech recognition when they started to become popular in 2009 and how they sort of have evolved over time in our field. Um, and initially when we uh, were getting these great results with them, how people looked at them as a black box. Uh, how we've, sort of, we've tried to understand uh, what these networks are learning uh, and why we're getting uh, really promising results. But I think that understanding uh, seems to have gone, um, you know, gone down over time. Okay, so a conventional speech recognition system um, that, you, that you would use on, on a phone today, this would be uh, anything in, you know, from Google or, or Apple or, or Amazon, whatnot, is going to be made up of the following components. So you would take your input speech signal. Um, there would often be a team of researchers who have done, you know, extensive research, research in what's the appropriate features to model the signal with. Uh, and then there's a lot of research that goes into what's the right model uh, to take these features and model some uh, and represent these by some subword units. Uh, that's known as the acoustic model. And then there's um, a decoder which will take subword units and map them to words. And oftentimes um, we could have a second pass rescoring system uh, which sees the entire utterance and, and rescores hypotheses. So I think the point I want to make on this slide is that there's a tremendous amount of uh, research and engineering that's sort of gone into every single component of this pipeline. And a lot of it requires very domain-specific knowledge. Um, so just to give you an example of complexity, without getting into a lot of details, if we just look at what an acoustic model, uh, all the research that is needed to go into acoustic model, we would need to know, um, you know what subword units to train this model with. Oftentimes there's a data sparsity issue, so we have to do some sort of a clustering. We then need an alignment so that we can train this model uh, with this. Then we need to know what the actual model is. Should it be a GMM? Should it be a DNN? So there's a lot of research over you know, years and years and years that have gone into acoustic modeling. <laughs> and the same with, uh, with decoding. For example, how do you take these subword units and um, map them to some sort of a lexicon? Then how do you take... Um, that gives you words, then how do you represent uh, the probability of words followed by other words, that's known as a language model. Uh, and then how do you actually uh, put the acoustic pronunciation and language models together to do decoding. And so again, these two slides are just meant to show sort of the complexity and the domain specific knowledge that's really needed for each of these components. And so when uh, we first started uh, seeing success with uh, neural networks uh, in speech, it was uh, with acoustic modeling. So if we just take an acoustic model, um, as I said, there's what we would, in the, in the past, what we'd do is we'd have uh, a set of, we'd take our signal and represent it by uh, a set of uh, features and a lot of uh, feature engineering research went into what are appropriate features for our signal. And then we'd take this uh, and build a classifier for example, a Gaussian mixture model uh, to discriminate between different uh, sounds. What neural networks sort of aim to do is say, well, we don't need all these, um, this feature engineering. Can we start with really, really simple features uh, and build a model which will do this feature extraction and uh, classification jointly? And what I've shown here is sort of historical speech recognition over time on a variety of different tasks. So uh, conversational speech or broadcast news. And what you can see is that we got huge trends in the uh, late 90s with uh, Gaussian mixture models and discriminative training, but then trends sort of saturated in the 2000 era. And um, we started looking at neural networks. I think they started to become popular around 2009. And you can see if you take Many people are familiar with switchboard, that's, the, that's conversational speech, it's basically plotting the red line here. If you take, um, uh, if you look at deep neural network performance on switchboard in around 2011, you see these huge gains again. And this sort of trend was confirmed by so many labs, you know, from around 2009, 2010, 2011. But people kept treating these networks as black boxes. I think they didn't really understand why are we getting these gains. Um, this very interesting paper 
came around in 2012 um, from Jeff Hinton's lab in Toronto, and it was basically looking at um, what is the network learning and why are we getting these improvements. And so what they did is uh, they took every layer of a neural network, um, which, is, uh, which will be multi, uh, they took the activations at every layer, they projected that down to two dimensions using uh, stochastic neighborhood embedding, that's TESNI. Uh, and then what they did is that they, they took, they analyzed these activations for eight different speakers in Timit, which is a phone recognition task. Uh, the benefit of Timit is that um, all the speakers are known and all the phones are, are uh, labeled. And what I'm showing here is the 2D plot from the first layer of the network where each color indicates a different speaker. And what you can see is that similar phones from different speakers are, are, group, are, are sort of grouped together at these lower layers. And if you do the same thing at the top layer of the network, um, what you can see is that you're getting now discrimination between different classes. So to me, what this is showing us is that the reason neural networks have been so powerful for uh, acoustic modeling is that they're sort of learning to do speaker adaptation and discriminative uh, feature extraction in the network. Whereas previously we had years and years of research of people who designed these hand engineered things separately outside of the network and then fed them to a, to a GMM. So doing this joint optimization in the network and sort of understanding what this is learning really explains why we got very nice results um, you know, for acoustic modeling. So if we transform a couple years later to uh, you know, when we went from DNNs, then came CNNs, and then LSTMs, more recently at Google we looked at can we actually take years of research in um, uh, multi-channel uh, multi uh, signal processing, particularly in, in beamforming, and can we do this in the network itself? Um, and so what we look to do is have a, um, what I've shown in the yellow box right here, is what we call a neural beamforming layer, where we design the network to sort of do um, beamforming jointly with the rest of the acoustic modeling. And if anybody has used uh, Google Home, this is actually the model that was launched for Google Home. And what you can see uh, in terms of results, if you look at the first line, which is sort of a baseline um, standard, you know, signal processing techniques for, for multi-channel speech recognition, compared to doing the beamforming in the network, you can see huge improvements uh, across a variety of different uh, noise conditions. And so, you know, we found neural beamforming is, is better than um, than using existing signal processing techniques. But then the question was why? Why do we get these gains? Um, and so we tried to go and, and understand, understand why. And what we did was we took the filters that we learn um, for different channels uh, and we plotted them. So the left here is basically showing um, five different uh, filter, uh, filter uh, impulse responses for different filters. Uh, green is channel one and blue is channel zero. And what you can see is that the filters are shifted versions of each other. So that is sort of telling us that the network is learning to steer to different uh, directions, which is effectively what the uh, you know, um, beamforming techniques are learning to do as well. So this sort of gives us some understanding um, of why potentially this layer is powerful. Um, and you know, quantitatively, we also see that it can replace a lot of these existing signal processing techniques. So I think as we've gone along, we've gotten results, we've tried, to ex ex uh, tried our best to explain and understand what the network is learning. Um, more recently, we have now said, can we take the entire speech recognition stack, you know, the acoustic pronunciation, language model, second pass your score, and just represent it by one neural network. Um, why do we want to do this? Well, there's a couple reasons. One, um, obviously simplicity. This really simplifies, instead of having, needing, you know, domain-specific knowledge in each of these individual areas, uh, can one neural network sort of uh, do all of this and have uh, equivalent performance? Um, another reason we'd want to do this is um, model size. You can think that uh, the model size of one neural network is going to be a lot smaller than having all these individual components. Another motivation is joint optimization of one model could potentially be better than having all these individual components that we somehow integrate together later. So we spent a couple years on this problem um, and we have recently found that we can take these end-to-end these models, give us pretty good performance on 
short voice search query and long dictation queries compared to a conventional model. And recently, actually yesterday, if anybody has seen, has seen the article, um, this model was actually launched on Gboard uh, on your phone. So you can actually do offline dictation on your phone uh, with an end-to-end -end model. And so what this has done is it really has removed a lot of the speech engineering that we've needed. Uh, and it's sort of lowered, uh, I think, the bar to entry into speech. Um, because, you know, we're saying years and years of, of engineering research and all of these different components we can just do now with one neural network. But I think what I keep seeing missing from all the papers that I've read in end to end uh, in the past couple years is uh, this understanding of wh what this network is learning and, and why. Uh, we saw that in the past with DNNs. I think we're, uh, we saw that with neural beam forming. Um, but I think, you know, this, we as a speech community need to still, again, analyze what is missing. And, and why is this important? So here's some uh, tail use cases. So coming from a production environment, um, we have to make sure that any model that we launch has to handle all, it's not just like, you know, having good word array at the head of the distribution on, on voice search or dictation, but it's also making sure that all our tail use cases are handled compared, compared to a conventional model. So here's, a, here's an example of a problem that, uh, that we have. So let's say you want to say, call me at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 0. Um, so our model is trained in what we call the written domain. So it's trained on these actual digits. So you can think that there's a big uh, out of vocabulary problem with, with this. And so what we see for long term long tail numeric sequence is that the model is often dropping numbers. So having some more speech specific knowledge, I think, and inject, in figuring out how to inject that into an N10 model is still an open research question. Um, often training in spoken domain is how we did it with conventional models. It's a little bit harder to do that in, in this uh, framework, but um, I think it's important to still take the speech specific knowledge and, uh, and, and adapt us to this. Another problem we see is when if you want to inject context. If I, know I'm a certain, if, I'm, if I know I'm in a certain location, I'm more likely to say certain places. If I want to say call, I'm more likely to call people in my contacts list. So sort of injecting that uh, knowledge <coughs> into the model is also a, a lot more difficult when you've now uh, represented all these separate components now by one neural network. So simplification is good. Uh, you know, it obviously a allows a lot of people to work on this problem, but I think uh, the model in our fields can also be improved by sort of uh, trying to understand where our model is doing poorly, why it's doing poorly, uh, you know, build on all of the things that we had as a community had did, did in the past to understand what these networks are learning and how can we inject a lot of speech specific knowledge into this model. So with that, I will uh, take some time for questions. Any questions? Oh. Very interesting. I wanted to ask, how do you balance between um, trying to just write what is heard and trying to put um, knowledge of the language inside to separate words or things like that? So, so you're asking me how do we bal ba balance knowledge of uh, yeah, language? Yeah, like, like one, two, three, so you decided to Yeah, this is numbers. a very good question. Um, so what we do right now is every time we are not doing well in a specific area or a specific domain, we just throw more data at it. So let's say um, we know that we recognize uh, y U.S. English very well, but we don't recognize British English very well. We just throw more data at it, even if that means synthesizing data. That's what we do. Um, and you can imagine in the long run, uh, that's, that could be a problem. Um, because it slows our training down. We now have, you know, this, the number of domains that we throw at it could be infinite. Um, so I think better understanding, instead of just better understanding where we're doing uh, poorly and why, uh, rather than just throwing more data at it is something we should be, we like, we need to address. It's an open research question. So, so the thing that, that always comes to me is when I use Siri in the car and I want to call my friend Michelle, and I say call Michelle, which she's in my contact, Siri would always answer, okay, I'll call you Shell. And I can't get over it. So there is some information 
that after you say call, you know, whatever, if it starts with me, you know. So there is like domain data. So, so what we do is um, if there's people that you um, are more likely to call, you enter them into some special list on your phone. Um, and then we build what's called a contextual biasing uh, language model. Uh, and we try to make sure that whenever you're saying like call or text, that um, we, we weight the probability of people that you would say more likely in your phone. But it, that's like, this is very easy to do in a conventional model. It was very tricky to do this in an end-to-end -end model. It was really tricky. Yeah. Because you're talking about like you have this one uh, neural network. So now. that's why you have to do it with data. So data, we solved part of it with data uh, for that case. We solved part of it by just taking an external model and, and fusing it in. Um, but it wasn't so straightforward as doing it with a conventional model for so many complexities that go on in this end-to-end -end system. Yeah. Question? Yeah. Uh, we'll Can't you constrain the architecture of the model to somehow correspond to the modules that you'd expect to see so you know where to intervene? But, the, but it will still be learned end to end and maybe have some extra connections as well. So like one way you could constrain it potentially is with some sort of a domain ID. Um, so we've tried this with like multilingual speech recognition uh, where we train it on a bunch of different languages but we also feed it the domain ID. Uh, and we find like if we don't feed it the domain ID, for example, then um, if you train with all the data, you'll do much less than training on each of the individual languages. But if you feed the domain ID, you know, this works fine. But then the problem is, like, if you feed it, if you train it with the domain ID, and then you speak, like, English, but you feed it a Hindi uh, language ID, it'll actually spit out Hindi, Hindi text, even if you're speaking in English. So these are things we still need to address. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.